Good afternoon from beautiful Barcelona. I am Alexis Roch, CEO of SciTech Triple Hub, the Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Thank you so much for joining us one more day for our Excited Talks, the series of free online lectures that SciTech Triple Hub and eBay have put forward together with other world-class institutions and leading international experts in science diplomacy and global affairs. During our last session last week, we explored the significance of energy diplomacy in advancing nuclear fusion technologies. Today, we will shift our focus to the critical field of health diplomacy, and in particular, to the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance, which is often referred to as a silent pandemic. Despite the abundance of safe, effective, and, and even inexpensive antibiotics since the mid 20th century, uh, trends in prevalence, incidence, and, and, and global border show we are far from eradicating infectious diseases. Antibiotic resistance poses a major challenge to global public health and is projected to cost millions of deaths every year by 2050. It is a complex issue that affects both human and, and, and animal health and has a potential to undermine global efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. Even in the European Union, around 2 million patients every year acquire health assisted uh, infections, causing around 175,000 annual deaths. As we know, infectious diseases uh, do not recognize uh, national borders and have the potential to spread rapidly across regions and, and, and continents. So the fight against antimicrobial resistance requires a coordinated global response that transcends national boundaries and, and promotes international cooperation. And this is where health diplomacy plays a crucial role in bridging the gap between public health and foreign policy. In recognition to the seriousness of, of, of this issue, world leaders have committed to promoting antibiotic stewardship and encouraging the development of new treatments. And this, this has opened up uh, new avenues for international scientific cooperation, as well as the formation of new global governance mechanisms to combat this pandemic. Today, we will be exploring the emerging role of health diplomacy in global health crisis and some of the current initiatives to tackle this emerging threat. What role can traditional diplomacy play in, in, in mitigating the impact of antimicrobial resistance on global health security? What are the most promising research and development initiatives aimed at developing new treatments? Or how we can create multidisciplinary partnerships to put countries to work together to fight this uh, silent pandemic? To shed light on some of these questions today, we are delighted to welcome three world-class experts in health diplomacy and science advice. We have with us Dr. Suresh Namdeo, visiting scholar at the Indian Institute of Science and, and, and former consultant to the United Nations Biological Weapons Convention. Good evening, Suresh. We have Dr. Sara Soto, a researcher, professor, and, 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 and the head of the viral and bacterial infectious program at the Barcelona Institute for Global Health. Good afternoon. And Dr. Peter Bayer, deputy executive director at the Global Antibiotic R&D Partnership. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's a real privilege to share the next hour with you discussing such a timely and, and, and relevant uh, issue. And Dr. Namdeo, I'd like to maybe start start with you. We are we are witnessing how how the emergence and spread of antibiotic resistant bacteria pose an increasingly urgent threat to, to public health. And this issue is particularly challenging for, for, for certain countries and certain populations where Vulnerable communities often face inadequate investment in R&D and insufficient surveillance and, and, and reporting infrastructure. And all these factors can definitely imply delays in detecting outbreaks of drug-resistant drug infections, which actually worsen the, the, the actual problem. So from your experience, how can science diplomacy be used to, to ensure a fair and, and, and equitable access, access to essential antimicrobial uh, treatments and technologies? And what are the key obstacles to achieving this? Uh, how we can address that? Thank you so much, uh, Alexis, for the kind invitation. It's so great to be here. And uh, also, um, it's so great to be part of this uh, very important panel. Uh, I believe uh, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, has emerged such a, such a big threat uh, around the world. And uh, I would share uh, my few cents uh, based on my experience. Uh, so you are right. Uh, there are uh, various countries and populations, uh, mostly in the global south, that uh, uh, at the moment does not uh, don't have the uh, capacity to 
uh, manage and uh, mitigate some of the challenges that comes with uh, that come with the uh, AMR uh, 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 things. Now, what we have is a, a lack of capacity in terms of, uh, you know, there's a first a lack of uh, in infrastructure, including the digital infrastructure for disease surveillance and reporting, but also you have a, a, aware, a lack of awareness, uh, and this is including in the among the scientific community and uh, in the in the, uh, among the policy makers. So, uh, in addition to the general public, there has to be better uh, communication of uh, of the importance of AMR uh, has to be done in in these uh, these places. You also uh, there is also a lack of uh, um, uh, you know um, communicating the uh, importance of AMR in a ways in ways that are culturally sensitive, uh, that understand, that are more kind of tailored and custom made to the requirement of uh, those particular countries and regions of the world. So uh, those things are there. And uh, uh, well, uh, health diplomacy has been long active working in, in those areas. And there have been various instruments uh, at bilateral or multilateral levels that have been put in place uh, to uh, respond to the challenges uh, coming with AMR in general. Uh, two uh, particular uh, instruments I would like to mention. These are the multilateral instruments. Uh, here we have first the International Health Regulation from WHO that was released in uh, uh, 2005. It's a multilateral legally binding uh, kind of a, a regulation uh, from the WHO side with 196 countries as a signatory to it. And uh, it has some mandatory and some uh, voluntary aspects and that's where uh, some of the problems are as well. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, it's very comprehensive and there has been various efforts to kind of strengthen it and provide more resources for the implementation of the international health regulation. Uh, the good thing about this particular regulation is that, uh, you know, irrespective of the source of uh, infection or source of how the disease is spreading is, is still valid and, uh, you know, you have different uh, protocols and standards and guidelines to apply uh, uh, when, when certain health emergency occur either due to AM, AMR or due to some other reasons as well. Uh, then you have something called a global health uh, security agenda. It's uh, also a multilateral kind of intergovernmental uh, framework with around 70 countries being part of it. It also provides a kind of a comprehensive list of uh, uh, different things that can be done to, uh, uh, you know, encounter the challenges posed due to uh, AMR uh, resistance. So there are uh, these these uh, multilateral instruments, but then also there are a lot of uh, bilateral uh, uh, arrangements, uh, both at the north-south and south-south uh, cooperation uh, kind of a mode. You have, for example, uh, the American CDC working with uh, various countries in Africa and Latin America and Southeast Asia uh, to in the area of AMR uh, and trying to provide support there. But you also have countries like India, which have their own programs uh, in terms of uh, there is something called iTech program to support. Uh, and provide the technological uh, uh, kind of know-how to other countries in the global south to deal with some of these uh, challenges. Now, the very, there are various obstacles in all of these things, as, as one can imagine. Uh, there is, a, a, well, I think, one of the most important one is a, a lack of understanding of the cultural, social, and behavioral uh, uh, things that can be done to better fight AMR. Uh, there is a lot of research coming from the science side, but there is a you know, little bit of lack of understanding from the social science side and the policy side on in, in terms of encountering uh, these challenges. And you have uh, uh, also um, different parts of the world have different needs uh, in terms of also their geography, the uh, you know, a general, a general genetic makeup of the population and so on, and also the genetic makeup of the uh, of the microbes that are there in that particular region, right? So there has to be more research done, in, which is more context specific to these parts of the world, which are, which face a lot of uh, challenges at the moment due to uh, AMR. And also, um, well, uh, when it comes to uh, many of the multilateral arrangements, uh, you know, there are always uh, these uh, geopolitical priorities and the challenges come into the picture. The things happening in some other area and some other part of the world affect, uh, uh, you know, sometimes the funding and the prioritization of these uh, important health related uh, challenges as well. Um, there are a number of NGOs working, uh, you know, and they do a lot of great work. But also, there is often, uh, especially in the countries of the Global South, there is uh, sometimes uh, suspicion of uh, the real purpose of the NGOs if there are any vested interest and so on. So those things are there and those challenges uh, uh, need to be overcome. Uh, well, uh, some of the ways for addressing those challenges would be like building partnership more with the local government. You go at the local level, at the city level, at the village level, and try to understand the challenges there. Try to understand the behavioral or social and cultural context in which you want to apply some of those uh, solutions. And also, uh, 
promote uh, more, let's say, policy R&D to uh, develop those specific policy uh, solutions uh, for, for, for these uh, different parts of the world. Now, um, and also, I think one of the very nice thing to do uh, in uh, in more and more fragmented and polarized world is to keep it uh, as unpolitical as possible. You know, if you want to get the funding support, if you want to build some kind of international consensus, just try to keep it as unpolitical and just specific uh, to uh, this particular good cause that on which I, I believe most countries can agree upon. And uh, yeah, um, promoting multilateral frameworks in general, including the uh, um, strengthening of the international health regulation would be a great step towards uh, this direction. So these are uh, my few thoughts, but I would be happy to discuss this further. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suresh. Uh, it, it, it is true that many times we, we, particularly when we talk health diplomacy or science diplomacy, we talk about all these multilateral frameworks and initiatives and so on, and we tend sometimes to forget uh, some social sciences or, or behavioral aspects or, or, or cultural related aspects that might might be a limitation when trying to implement some specific uh, policies in, in in some places in the world. Uh, thank you so much for for for, for the, your intervention and this and this highlight. Um, moving to to you, Doctor Doctor Soto, in the last uh, in the last thirty years, there's been a sixfold increase in in penicillin related drugs use in in farm animals, and as a consequence, this has led to a significant rise in antimicrobial resistance, responsible for about. 5 million deaths annually on global scale, according to the World Health Organization. I think that we can reasonably say that this trend emphasizes uh, the urgent need for an effective uh, strategy to fight antibiotic resistance and, and protect public health. Um, from your perspective, from your experience, how we can balance the need for effective bacterial infection treatment with the need to reduce antibiotic use and, and, and preserve their, their efficacy? What role should policymakers across countries play in this effort? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, Alexis, to invite me into this uh, to this de debate. Um, in my opinion, both uh, both things, uh, the uh, new effective treatments and also the reduction of consumption of the antibiotics, are key points to combat antimicrobial resistance. In this sense, for many many years, uh, antibiotics have been uh, misused and abused. In both in clinical settings and animal settings. In animal health, uh, antibiotics will uh, have been used not only for in treatment of infectious diseases, but also for growth promoter and also uh, prophylaxis. And in, in some years ago, here at least here in Spain and mostly in most the South uh, countries in Europe, you can buy antibiotics without prescription and you can go to the pharmacy and take an antibiotic for a flu or, or for any infection caused by virus. This uh, has been the, the motor of the of the you know, of this problem that we have now. In the sense of the reduction, I I, I could explain you the the example of Spain. This is a south country, but we had something good. We had uh, promoted by the national plan for the microbial resistance. We had the program reduced. And they are uh, trying to reduce the consumption of antibiotics in all animals uh, for human consum consumption, like a turkey, poultry, um, cows, and also small animals, rabbits. And we are uh, in the 100% uh, of reduction of cholesterol in animal production. That is a great uh, step because now in clinical setting, we had cholesterol resistant strains. That was the last antibiotic that we uh, rescued to, to human treatment. And also in primary care, they are now doing uh, tests to determine if it's a viral or bacterial infection that also can uh, be very useful to reduce the anti antimicrobial consumption. But we know also not only to reduce this consumption, but also new treatments, but new uh, antibiotics with new mechanism of action. The, the most antibiotics that they are now in, in the pipeline are uh, derivates from the existing ones, and the bacteria in a few months, in a few years, could be resistant to this one. And we need this innovative step. Now it's very complicated because also to this problem of, of uh, discovering new antimicrobials, we have the problem that the pharma companies are being reluctant to, to invest in antibiotics, no? because there are no uh, revenue a very profit than anti-cancer drugs or something like that. 
but now they are uh, also trying to to enhance the discovery of antimicrobials with the Netflix model. The Netflix model that was implemented in the UK, there was a pilot in UK and now in another European country, that's like a subscription as Netflix. The health, um, the health system pay a amount every year, sell or not sell the antibiotic. And we had this antibiotic like in a reserve no, for, for new treatments. For the reason this is a balance of the both is to avoid a high consumption of antibiotics and also to uh, discover and to research in, in antibiotics. What uh, can do the policy, policy makers? Well, the policy makers like uh, pharma companies, uh, the governments, the European Commission, all these things, uh, we need more investment, more funding, more funds to, 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 to research and investigating antimicrobial, and new antimicrobials. And also in other alternatives, because now they are existing another alternative like phages, uh, antibodies, vaccines. No, we need to, to, to research it more, more in depth in the, all these new treatments. But also we need support for the governments in, in at regional and national, uh, European level and uh, worldwide level. Because in, in Spain, uh, health uh, is for its communi autonomous community. And they have different national plans of implementation of the national plans of antimicrobial resistance. Uh, some of or another or other follower know the recommendation from the World Health Organization. And we did unify all this in, in, at global level. And this is the important thing for the policymakers in this sense. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Well, uh, actually, this, this coordination, act, coordination actions and, 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 and also bringing incentive to the different stakeholders to, to get more involved into this uh, is, is one of the topics I would like to cover with uh, the question to Dr. Bayer. Um, Peter, it is uh, increasingly evident that there is a critical need for, 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 more, for, for innovative and effective treatments to combat antimicrobial resistance. And, and a recent review from the World Health Organization on the number of, of new antibiotics currently in the pipeline, as Sandra as Sarah was saying, shows that just 12 new antibiotics have entered the market in the last five years, and there are far too few currently under development in, in, in clinical trials against pathogens considered critical nowadays. And at the same time, we see how while vaccines, for example, have shown potential as a highly effective tool, their development and approval face uh, significant regulatory obstacles and, and also high costs. So collaboration among scientists, government agencies, uh, the pharma sector and other relevant international stakeholders is, is, is essential to, to address this pandemic. So from your experience, what innovative funding mechanisms and also incentive strategies can help overcome some of these challenges we are discussing today? And what are some of the ethical considerations surrounding uh, scientific collaboration in this field, uh, particularly with regard to intellectual property or even an equitable access to, to new treatments. Thank you so much, Alexis. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm very happy to be the third speaker. So my esteemed co-panelists already prepared the ground. Thank you so much. I'm sitting here in the, um, in the uh, new WHO building in Geneva. So if people are walking by, this is because I'm actually in the lobby. Um, yeah, uh, I want to say a few words uh, on, on what we are doing. GATP is a product development and access partnership um, uh, based in Geneva, but we do have offices in South Africa. Um, we are having people in India on the ground. We are hiring a first position in Latin America. So if anybody is interested in that one, please visit our website. Um, what we are doing is we are developing new innovative antibiotics against the WHO identified priorities. And we are also looking into old antibiotics and to see whether we can revive old forgotten antibiotics or work with new generic combinations. Currently, we are focusing on um, uh, the biggest killers. The, 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 that is where you have the highest mortality in terms of drug bug combinations. Um, we are focusing on three disease areas. Uh, one is sepsis and serious bacterial infections. There we have uh, one product um, in the pipeline with uh, our industrial partner, Venetorix. We finished uh, successfully the um, phase three trial for cefibim tanipobactam, which is a new reserve antibiotic for serious bacterial infections. 
Um, it's also an innovative antibiotic. Uh, Professor Soto mentioned that we are lacking actually innovation in the pipeline. This is one of the few innovative products. Um, we also have a license to Cafidericol, which is a new fourth generation cephalosporin um, that was developed by Shionogi. We have the license for 135 countries, and that is where it comes to access. You spoke about equitable access, affordability. That is, of course, enshrined in our DNA. I mean, we have been set up together by DNDI and WHO. We are there to provide actually um, access to new affordable antibiotics. And this license agreement with uh, Cafe Dorocol is one of our big access projects. At the moment, we are discussing, I mean, we're ne start negotiating a sub-license agreement with a manufacturer that we have identified um, using an open call, so that it, it was also a transparent um, process. In this license agreement, we are certainly going to include terms about the quality uh, but also about the pricing, um, but also about environmentally sound manufacturing standards, which is also very important. So this is really exciting to see how can we make this work in practice. A very important uh, factor is, of course, how can we make this a business case for our manufacturer? This company needs to actually make a certain amount of profit to to invest in the manufacturing technology which is a uh, um, um, technology wise uh, a quite difficult uh, a difficult endeavor and um, so that is it's really going to be an experiment to to see how this is going to work out we work, uh, the other area we work in is um, children antibiotics because that is uh, a very underfunded area. We just started a new trial to find new combinations of existing generic treatments for neonatal sepsis, which is um, you have a very high mortality in low and middle income countries in particular um, because of uh, drug resistant neonatal sepsis. And uh, we want to come up with a new um, cheap, uh, uh, efficacious new treatment regimen regimen because we have seen in our observational trial that we've done in 11 countries that there is widespread resistance to the current uh, standard of care and then we have a drug which is for um, uh, drug resistant gonorrhea zoliflodacin we have finished the recruitment for the phase three trial and we are now waiting for the data so um we do hope that we are making the non-inferiority margin and can register with our industrial partner in TASIS next year. Um, again, this is one of the few innovative antibiotics in the pipeline. Um, and we are very excited that, that we may be moving to registration um, in 2024, 2025. And why are we doing this? Well, this is what Professor Soto already said. Antibiotics is not a very profitable business. Um, the big pharmaceutical companies, the vast majority, have walked out um, because uh, you, you have, um, um, there are very little chances that you're going to make a lot of money. I can happily go into this in further detail, but maybe I wanted to focus a little more on the science diplomacy. And may, one good example is maybe how we set up GARP. I back then I was in WHO and we did this together with DNDI and we looked at the different, we did a process looking at different options. You know, and there was a proposal for an AMI international treaty. There was a proposal put forward um, by industry, which was uh, basically um, something around a health impact fund. There was a proposal by Thomas Pogger. I think that one was the health impact fund. The other one had a different title, I can't remember. But we looked at a range of models and we looked at them also in terms of feasibility. And we knew a treaty will take a lot of time. For the funds, there was, you know, there was not the real amount, you know, of commitment in terms of funding. But we knew from, from DNDI that we could easily set up a product development partnership to actually get the work started. And that's why we built a coalition around GARP where we had um, on board the Doctors Without Borders. Um, we, we, the South Center was supporting it. We had countries like uh, uh, Germany, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland who gave us seed funding. But we also had the big companies who were still in the antibiotic business like MSD or GSK, who we, we managed to convince to say, yes, we, they, they think it's a good idea because we are going to do things that um, the industry is not going to do. 
and this is i think quite unique if you manage to get you know that doctors without borders the south center uh, big pharma and some other countries they all agree that this is a good idea you know that is when you when you basically know that you have a good start um and as as uh, so you said don't politicize it you know i mean just focus on the problem and try to actually come up with a solution to the problem and um, i think that is where we have been quite successful including in in setting up the portfolio there of course it's science and diplomacy working with companies you asked about how you manage issues around intellectual property well basically it's you know it's negotiations you you need to know what you want and you, we know of course what we want um so when we talk to companies we invest or we do stuff with them for them we invest money we want territory so we want to be have the rights to actually um distribute the product in certain countries and our ambition is to have as many um of the upper middle income countries as possible and we are very proud that in the cafe derico license for example we have the whole latin america which includes countries like brazil which often are left out out of these voluntary licensing agreement arrangements and that is what makes us um uh, um optimistic that this can be done and it always needs of course good industrial partners and uh, and we we and and you know this is diplomacy on how are you able to actually convince them to partner with you uh in terms of funding you can look at it from both sides i think overall we have managed to raise around 200 million euros so far there's certainly success but if you look at r d costs is not a lot of money um there are some countries which are very um proactive in, in in amr like the uk germany and they also they they walk the talk you know they also invest um we got money as i mentioned from the netherlands monaco south africa a couple of others but they are also those countries who may actually sign all these declarations in the g7 and g20 but they never invest and that is where i see we have that we have to change and they they don't actually have to invest necessarily in r d let them invest in ipc it's probably even a more cost effective investment but they need to do something and you will have you need money you know it's always that you will have to invest some a certain amount of money thank you so much back to you thank you so much dr bayer for for, for your insights um it's a really a, like a highlight that 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 we often forget that, that how diverse the, the, the set of stakeholders in science diplomacy are. And it's not just like uh, treaties among uh, national governments or, or some international organizations, but like considering the industry, uh, major nonprofits or global nonprofits and, and keeping all these different stakeholders aligned in, in this kind of like a triple helix or quadruple helix or however you want to call it, uh, um, approach when facing this kind of, of, of challenges like the one we are, we are discussing today. Before opening the floor for questions, uh, well, let me remind to our audience that you can post your questions on, 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 on the chat uh, tab on, on the right of your screen. Before opening for questions, I'd like to ask the three of you a, a very last uh, a quick question. Given your, your expertise and, and experience in this field, how do you think that scientists and, and, and policy makers, uh, considering that they, they come from different backgrounds and, and they, they they, they, they face this, this challenge in, in very different perspective. How can they work together to better rise awareness about the, the, the dangers of antimicrobial resistance among, among civil society, but also among policy, other policymakers or other fields of science? And also how the need for more research and, and development for, for new solutions uh, can be like highlighted and, 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 and this awareness can be raised both domestically and internationally. What, what, what is at the end of the day the opportunities for health diplomacy or, or science diplomacy in, in, in this scenario? Maybe we can start by, by, by you, Dr. Dr. Namdeo. Sure. Uh, thanks, Alexis. Uh, so, yeah, well, first of all, uh, there is a, as I was mentioning earlier, there is a huge uh, need for awareness raising even among the scientists and the policymakers. So scientists and policymakers, uh, I think there is a, always this a huge gap in terms of uh, 
you know understanding of a topic then also about the terminology the priorities the timelines there are there are always these gaps among these different communities and uh, what i think could be a very nice first step is to do more joint activities that involve people from both of these uh, communities you have some bureaucrats or policy makers and you also have some scientists trying to discuss and debate and understand each other's challenges what sometimes happen a lot i have seen like scientists come up with some things and they want just bureaucrats to just work on it or policy makers just work on it and get it done it doesn't work that way you have to understand from their side uh, practically what is possible what is not policy possible what are the challenges and within that scope of things you propose some things and try to get those things done you know a more funding uh, um, also for the policy side of things would be really nice uh, which uh, actually invest on give, developing a cadre of uh, professionals who understand and speak the languages of both of these communities. So that would be, I think, a very nice uh, investment. And in general, uh, more multi-stakeholder engagement where you have also people from industry, people from uh, who, are, who are doing the policy research, who are doing the scientific research, and uh, also uh, patients, uh, patient groups and so on, right? So those kind of multi-stakeholder engagement uh, should be encouraged for science, uh, Institutes and research lab, you need, they need to probably do more of, uh, you know, invest a bit more on creating uh, these channels of communication, which is which are interesting and which could be understand by a lay person and one need not be an expert in order to get the basic idea about the importance of things. So there is a, some a little bit of investment that is needed there. Um, well, in, in terms of opportunity for uh, health and science diplomacy, you also you know, uh, there needs to be maybe when you are talking about multilateral or bilateral kind of arrangement, more task forces or committees or regional committees uh, can be created. For example, some um, some joint uh, uh, so joint kind of, kind of expert committee for one part of uh, uh, or a set of low and middle income countries uh, based in one part of the world. You of course uh, we need a more of international co collaborations in terms of uh, you know pure basic science collaboration, but also, you know, exchange of experts, exchange of researchers and joint projects, maybe establishing some joint research center for AMR and so on. Um, now, moving to the, uh, you know, the basic, uh, where we need to do more R&D uh, when it comes to ANR, in my, my humble opinion, uh, I think a lot of it is already being done, but developing new kind of antibiotics uh, and also improving the existing antibiotics and, you know, contextualizing them based on because of, uh, some countries or some places one antibiotic might still work but it will not work in other part of the world so having that kind of uh, understanding uh, there and also more uh, uh, investment in surveillance and tracking of uh, amr uh, across different regions and across different countries would be hugely beneficial uh, as i mentioned earlier it would be really nice to have more investment on in the behavioral behavioral and social cultural kind of elements uh, to understand the, it from all different perspective and try to come up with the best solution and uh, also uh, as i was saying uh, more on the policy research side we need uh, people who speak and understand the language of the policy makers and the scientists both. thank you thank you so much uh, dr nandem um dr soto would you like to build on that yes i agree with dr nandeo in that we need more uh, knowledge on the of the problem for the policy makers also for the for the the people but also for the general people the general people know that you take the uh, amoxicillin and you uh, we can, uh, do have the infection but there is no uh, so much evidence for the general public that there is a problem yet no it's like a, when the uh, some uh, illness that has, until a famous person don't die from this uh, illness, the general public is unnoticed un un infection. For the reason, I think we had to do uh, more campaigns about the, the problem of the microbial resistance and also how we, uh, uh, what is doing, uh, what are the alternatives, the use, uh, the responsible use of antibiotics, but also in the personnel from primary care hospitals because they need training, training about the IPC measures, uh, also need funds in the hospital to create these IPC uh, teams, because it's very important now with the COVID was a disaster about that, no? because all people is dedicated to COVID, but no to IPC policies. And also in the surveillance, I think we need more, more efforts in, in surveillance in, in, in many countries. 
Um, in the terms of uh, research, I think we can also see uh, to the nature, the nature, uh, with the water, oceans, rivers, uh, all things, there is a good source for antibiotics. No? More than, 80, I think, the 80% of the antibiotics uh, that we use in clinical come from the nature. And I think, and also a point of, of focus to research on, of new antibiotics. But also, as I commented before, we need also that the general public uh, know about this problem. They don't go to the clinician and say, no, I need I need antibiotic, I need antibiotic, take me antibiotic. If no, they come out from the from the from the from the hospital very, very angry because they have no antibiotic. And I think we need more campaigns about that. Since the children <laughs> to the adults and the other people. I need within this this uh, type of campaign. Yeah, totally like uh, awareness to, to the, the general population, but as well as you were saying to, to the primary healthcare uh, professionals uh, about not not abusing of, of, of the use of antibiotics is 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 is, is key. Um, Dr. Bayer, would you like would you like to hop in? Yeah, very briefly. I'm I'm very excited to see all the questions in the in the chat. Uh, it's really good to see that um, you know that there's a lot of interest. I wanted to pick up uh, um, the question about um, equitable access to treatment because that is basically at the core. There's no point in actually doing innovation if then um, these new drugs are only available in very few countries. And that's what we have seen with these 12 antibiotics. I think Sarah mentioned were approved in the past years. They have been registered mostly in the US and in a couple of other countries. Many of them have not even registered in Canada or in, in the European Union. Um, so, and that is why they, we are working, we are focusing actually on low and middle income countries. And um, that is also why we are doing the majority of our clinical trials in these countries, because that is where the disease burden is. I think, so Yesha, you mentioned that, that they're actually different the resistance is not equal. It's very different from, you know, where I'm here in Geneva and Switzerland versus uh, in Kenya or in India. So the observational study we did for neonatal sepsis, we looked at the resistance in 19 hospitals across 11 countries, including India, Kenya, South Africa, uh, Brazil. And, you know, the, 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 the bacteria are different that are causing actually the sepsis. But also the resistance levels are different and against which treatments they are resistant. And also the, the hospitals are using different treatment combinations. So you really have to look at it from one country to the other. And that is, um, that is challenging and that means you have to go where the disease burden is. There's no point in developing this in Europe and then trying to actually use it in, in, in Asia and Africa. And the same for our gonorrhea treatment. Of course, we know that the drug resistant, all these um, ceftriaxone drug resistant outbreaks in UK, US were actually cases that were imported by by actually people who had unprotected sex in in mainly in Southeast Asia. So that is where you have to go and where that's where you have to actually treat people if you if you want to solve this problem. And that is what we are going to do and 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 so you know this is I think these product development partnerships are proven um, mechanism to ensure that there is equitable access. Um, and somebody else asked about philanthropy and, and the link. I think it's only Gates Foundation and Wellcome Trust who would put significant amounts of money against uh, and against research and whether it's, you know, I mean, you can also look at neglected tropical diseases. All this philanthropy, I mean, whether you know what we what you read in the newspaper i mean maybe the other day somebody told me i have to get in front of jeff bezos ex-wife and she will give me money but you know what it's not so easy i don't know maybe you can help me well let's see if if, if we can help somehow or if, uh, some of the co-speakers can can support on that uh thank you so much for, for for your answers let's 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 we already started discussing some of the questions from the audience uh through dr Dr. Bayer, but let's let's definitely open now the, the floor for questions. We have a couple of questions, both from from one from Clara and another from Senyana, that are a bit in the same line, uh, highlighting how you know, like the uh, unequal access to treatments in, in in the global north and in the global south, and how this 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 gap might be widening. So, how can 
science diplomacy help or we kind of what kind of examples we have where where we help to to advocate uh that the, the global north countries get committed to supporting uh those countries that, that they have structural disadvantages when trying to implement some of the policies or recommendations you, you were suggesting today anyone on this uh that's okay so yeah in general like uh there is a huge inequality of access for many of the new drugs that are coming up and that's uh, always a problem and it's also a very let's say geopolitically debated issues at times because you know companies based on different countries have their own uh, commercial interest and countries also have the other interest and those things come into the picture and it becomes very difficult to you know have uh, that kind of access everywhere there are generic drugs of course but there are also some issues with that uh, in terms of their potency and so on so so those challenges are there and uh, there are efforts to bridge those there are uh, well some some funding from let's say philanthropic or endowment uh, grants and so on that uh, you know provide uh, also research funding for countries in the developing world to develop their own uh, drugs on their own instead of just relying on the drugs that uh, come to them much, uh, much later at a much later date, date coming from the west and they are not always suitable for those countries so there needs to be more of the uh, local development of the drugs that is needed and uh, there is there is increasingly more attention that is uh, given to it but we have a long way to go in 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 that direction and uh, yeah science diplomacy can play a role there as uh, you know trying to get more and more investment uh, or r and d in those countries try to open those channels uh, up for uh, uh, you know kind of development uh, of of these drugs and uh, more r and d and more innovation happening in those countries so the kind of a component of innovation diplomacy can also uh, come into the picture where these countries uh, try to become more attractive place for drug manufacturers to come there and develop and uh, you know uh, design drugs there so that's a uh, short answer from my side thanks well i, I would highlight uh, uh, dr namdeo as well that that uh, also during during the COVID pandemic, we saw that the bottleneck on production was mainly on the global south and particularly South Asia uh, or India, where there is plenty of, of pharma manufacturers and, and sometimes that the bottleneck was on that side. So it's like uh, um, there was this, this disparity that somehow you were already um, highlighting. We also have a, a, a more like a like a rather technical question from from Gabriela in the audience. She's asking, what are the opportunities uh, to do some translational research on the use of new drug technologies such as uh, um, mRNA uh, based uh, vaccines in, in in the fight against uh, uh, this challenge? You mentioned uh, Dr. Bayer that you were already working on on, on some vaccines on uh, based on this technology, right? Um... So we don't we don't do currently um, vaccine development as GARP. Uh, I've posted in the chat a report I've did I've done with my WHO team before I left, and we looked at all these uh, bacterial pathogens and what kind of vaccines are in development. So there you can see for which of these pathogens we do have actually vaccine candidates. There and we know that we have some vaccines. We have a typhoid vaccine certainly expanding the use of the better um, newer uh, typhoid vaccines would go a long way in reducing actually antibiotic uh, um, use and uh, and resistance uh, the pneumococcal vaccine is another example uh, there are a couple of candidates where it's pretty likely that we will see vaccines like gonorrhea but then they are also one of the biggest challenges in the gram negative area like acinetobacter um, it's scientifically very challenging to develop a vaccine. That's what I understand. Um, and also, if you would have a vaccine, the question is also, whom would you vaccinate? Because that's also what we have seen with COVID-19. Yes, if you have vaccines, that doesn't mean that actually, you know, people want to actually take the vaccine. Um, and also, you would have to identify uh, the target population. Um, and then there are some companies who would say, yes, why don't we vaccinate every patient who goes into a hospital to have a planned surgery? But, you know, would actually patients want to go into a hospital where they have to get a vaccine to not get infected with Acinetobacter? You know, I mean, like, and and would that... So th there, there are questions about the scientific um the the possible you know can we scientifically make it but then also 
if we would have a vaccine, what would we do with it? And um, and so, yes, the mRNA te te technology I've seen, there is now a, a vaccine for plague, uh, which is based on the mRNA vaccine. It's not a approved vaccine, huh? but there's a, you know, an initial candidate. Um, but I wouldn't count on seeing so many um, in the near future. Thank you. Dr. Soto, would you like to build on that? Yes, uh, the not only vaccine related to RNA, but also the use of uh, microRNA uh, as biomarkers of the multidrug resistant infection are being developing to have a better uh, diagnostic and, and treatment. I don't know if this as well the question of Gabriela. Thank you. Um, we also we, we, we discussed um, um, today also how to, or mainly how to raise awareness among population about the use of uh, uh, antibiotics. And, and, and so on. we have a question uh, among the audience about then what alternative strategies can be developed to reduce the need of antibiotics at farms when, when, when we are producing like stock and animals and so on to, to basically prevent the emergence of, of the spread of uh, AMR. What solutions at this first stage uh, uh, could be implemented? Well, uh, I don't know if it's uh, at the moment fully really possible to uh, not rely on uh, antimicrobiotics at all at the moment, but we can reduce their need and requirement for uh, livestock by, you know, having some basic uh, sanitary measures, let's say, where the livestock is there. And also, if there is a disease that seems to be happen in one animal, like you isolate that animal and put it in a different place, you also make sure there is some kind of entry access. It's not any random person or animal just entering your farm, which can, you know, actually lead to some diseases to those animals. There are some very basic, uh, you know, uh, safety measures that uh, one can employ, and they can be actually very, very effective on uh, many things. You are making sure that uh, kind of uh, food that uh, things you are feeding to the animal are uh, are good and they are not infected themselves. You have some kind of routine checkup by doctors for the animals and so on. So those things uh, uh, are very small and a lot of people already do that, but like doing them properly and having those, uh, let's say internal and external security measures and safety measures in place can have a huge impact in reducing the need of anti-microbiotics anti uh, in the animals in the first place. Thanks. Dr. Mayer. Yeah, I mean, so you just summarized it. You know, I mean, it's as with humans. If you in, if you avoid exposure to resistant bacteria, then your animal is not going to go sick, and then you don't need to treat them with antibiotics. Um, and as he said, there are very simple sanitary measures that farmers can take. They are very cost effective, and they also increase the yield. So you can actually. Farmers will be happy to to actually um, take these measures up because it's also you know making a better business out of out of what they are doing. Um, and we have seen France, UK, Germany, Switzerland over the past ten years they have reduced antibiotic consumption in animals by about fifty percent, roughly. Um, and so it is possible. Ba basically, in the past they used antibiotics to replace actually um, the the deficits in sanitary measures. And uh, I think this is a very encouraging development. And uh, are those sanitary measures uh, more expensive or less cost effective? And then the challenge for the developing world to, to implement compared to the use of uh, antibiotics uh, among, among livestock? There is another alternative, but it's the, the use of prebiotics in the, in the animals in order to have uh, enhance the immune system about the infection, but also one of the most important measures like uh, Nandeo say, no? to have the capacity to isolate the, the infected animal from the other ones. In some cases, it's very difficult because there are um, a lot of animals and there are more space, but it is it's the most, uh, the simplest uh, uh, measure to avoid the, the give antibiotics to all the on the farm. Uh, actually, we had a question among our our our, our participants uh, within this direction: how complementary or alternative therapies using plants or uh, animal-based products could be used to substitute antibiotics in the management of infections and, and disease among animals, and and if yes, why is this not generally acceptable or not generally used compared to to antibiotics? 
Or we can I jump think somebody that. mentioned, somebody said before, it's a lot about culture. You know, I'm living in Switzerland and the German speaking population in Switzerland is using significantly less antibiotics than the French speaking um, population. It's not that the French speaking population has more uh, bacteria infections. It is not. It's just that the French, I mean, the culture in the part where I live is to actually, if you're sick, you take a medication and that can be an antibiotic. While the German speaking population would probably rather um, revert to cranberry juice and uh, and some, you know, let's say plant-based medicine you use at home and go to bed and wait for a week until to see whether it gets better. And there are certainly infections, in particular in children like otitis, but many of the respiratory infections where we should go back and not immediately um, go to use antibiotics, but Basically, as the colleague suggested, try out some other more traditional, um, um, uh, uh, um, you know, plant-based things, and you know, wait and see and see does it go away, and and do I really need to use antibiotics? And and as I said, I mean, if you see the consumption between you compare the Netherlands to Italy, it's it's you know, there's a huge, I mean, uh, um, discrepancy in terms of of use of antibiotics. Well, moving to a more like science diplomacy oriented question from, from Gabriela. She's saying like if, if, if international organizations like the International Science Council uh, can play a role in, in, in rising awareness through all their members, academies, uh, science unions and so on. And she's also asking if, uh, if, the, if the UN can be of help and because it's, it seems that it's more like a nation oriented efforts, the ones that are being uh, undertaken. And, and, and if it would make sense to create, like, to build a national advocacy group for, for on, on, on antimicrobial resistance. What's your take on that? So if I may just pitch in. Um, well, so regarding the first uh, question about the International Science Council, uh, yes, uh, um, well, I think almost all the large, uh, all the science academies are a member of uh, International Science Council. And it does a lot of work on some international science policy and come up with different policy recommendations. and. Uh, our best practices at times and which are highly regarded and uh, um, you know um, uh, any industry or government body would take them very seriously um, but that being said uh, you know um, not all science academies have like equally strong connections with uh, isc and many science academies do their things mostly independently and they don't they are not always following up on all the things that are recommended by International Science Council. So while it's important to engage with International Science Council and come to uh, try to come up with some uh, kind of an inter more international framework, uh, which IAC can also play a big role in kind of bringing scientific expertise from one part of the world to the other part of the world and try to you know, uh, uh, help uh, provide scientific evidence there as well. But uh, also um, the the science academies at the local and the national level should also be engaged uh, equally you have to understand the local needs and you have to talk with the scientists there in order to see what, what scientists and also doctors there to see what kind of challenges uh, they are facing with the AMR. so uh, i believe that was the first part second was regarding the un um so uh, United Nations, uh, the great thing about the UN is that it has a great convening power. Like it can really get all the all the uh, different uh, countries and all the all the different NGOs on one platform, and uh, that's a, that's a great thing. Then there are challenges also, like uh, you, in in terms of implementation, it's uh, largely left to the uh, different countries to do their things. So we can leverage that convening power of the UN to you know act as a platform for uh, doing more, uh, let's say, the capacity building things. You can have more uh, fellowships or more trainings or more workshops and more events like this one, for example, done through UN platform that can reach uh, a larger audience. And, uh, you know, also um, UN can engage effectively with uh, industry to some extent. And then also, uh, you know, providing the advice to the government and the industry in terms of the uh, uh, contextualizing the local AMR needs uh, with the with the global uh, uh, you know situation there UN can play a big role there and also you know in partnership maybe with international science council bring in also the scientific expertise and the academic expertise to the whole discussion so multi stakeholder engagement uh, can be a very key area where UN be, can be very instrumental in bringing all the players together to move the discussion forward uh, but yes, a lot of implementing things do come under the domain of the national government and uh, 
you know, there also we can have a different kind of advocacies done by NGOs and so on. But UN still has a very important play, a role to play in the whole picture. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Namdeo. Dr. Soto, the rear. Anything yes. on that? I, I would like to, to to say something about the building of national advocacy groups on antimicrobial resistance. In most of the European countries, this is a, a group in this country that develop and implement the for the development or an implementation of the national plan for antimicrobial resistance following following the um, the, the policies from the European Commission and also for the WHO, and they are for by uh, ministries uh, uh, of this country and also scienti scientists, uh, the medical council, the veterinary council, pharmacy council, or a lot of di different uh, actors that join effort to do that, to have a uh, registration of the cell of antibiotics in veterinary, in clinical settings, also try to survey the, pres the prescriptions and, and also the resistance that they found in the different hospitals. But um, I think in, in some places uh, we need more uh, people uh, um, doing that, no? more uh, human resources to uh, allow arrive to all, 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 all places in, in this country. But they are, the in, in, at least in, in Europe, they are in this country at, at advocacy group on antimicrobial resistance. Peter, any final thoughts? I can say something about the uh, question on fungi, if you want. Please, we can we can have this last question on, on, on the resistance, antimicrobial resistance on, on fungi. Yeah, I see, uh, Juan Carlos, you, you also already posted the WHO fungal priority pathogens list. That's something that I did with my team at WHO be before I moved over to GARDP. Um, and you ask, why do we not, you know, why, why are we not focusing on it? Because it's an under-researched area. I think there's so many things that happen um, that we don't know. And it is, um, as, you, as you imply, pretty bad. I mean, there are azos that are used massively in, you know, in raising strawberries, which probably is not the, um, the, you know, the most urgently needed commodity, although I love strawberries. But so we, we certainly don't make good use of the limited, the limit number of antifungal agents that, that we are having. And um, you have a much uh, bigger use in agriculture of antifungals than you have of uh, antibacterial treatments. So the overlap between using the antifungal agents in agriculture and animals and in humans, it's much bigger, which means that the resistance is spreading across the environment in the three areas much faster. And, and that means that we are going to burn these, uh, um, you know, currently still existing antifungal treatments. And, and that is, you know, it may become a huge problem. And, and I don't think that we, that, you know, the limitations of, of um, how do we limit the use of antifungal agents in agriculture is very complicated because, of course, many of these um, industrial scale productions heavily rely on these agents to ensure that 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 they don't lose the yield. Uh, so um, it's something that we definitely need to to be much more vigilant working with FAO um, on the agricultural use. Thank you. I'm, I'm afraid we're running out of time, so let's wrap up here. Um, thank you so much, Suresh, uh, Sarah, and, and, and Peter, for, for, for sharing with us your valuable insights on health diplomacy and its crucial role in, in, in shaping global policy, particularly in IMR, as we are discussing today. Today's conversation has emphasized the importance of science diplomacy in navigating this uh, complex global landscape and, and promoting positive change in global health through uh, innovative funding, multi-stakeholder coalitions, rising awareness, and, and also how to, to create new incentive strategies. So we hope that policymakers, as, as our speakers were saying, our policymakers worldwide will, will take good note of the significance of this endeavor and prioritize science diplomacy in, in, in their efforts. Let me take this opportunity to remind you that if you would like to get certified in science diplomacy, applications for our Science Diplomacy Summer School are still open. This unique immersive training will take place the first week of July in the heart of beautiful Barcelona. 
This university program organized by SciDeck People Hub and eBay together with other uh, living institutions will allow you to build your knowledge and, and, and your skills in science diplomacy and further your career into some of the topics we have been discussing in these online lectures at the intersection of science and diplomacy, including climate change, AI diplomacy, global health, sustainable development, and the study of different national and regional approaches and, and, and strategies to, to science diplomacy. Thank you so much and see you on Wednesday.